Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Mark Mercer. I teach in the philosophy department here at St. Mary's, and I'll moderate today's discussion on academic freedom for students. How free should the students be? The panelists are Russell Curry, Mark Keller, Osama Nasrallah, and Lindsay Shepard. Russell is a fourth year philosophy student, uh, philosophy honors student at St. Mary's, just about to finish his program. Mark has a bachelor's and a master's in philosophy, both from St. Mary's. He successfully defended his master's thesis on liberal education in August 2016. Osama Nasrallah is a fourth year marketing student in the Sobe School of Business. He is also currently the president of the St. Mary's University Students Association. Lindsay Shepard has a BA in communication from Simon Fraser University, and she's now a master's student in cultural analysis and social theory at Wilfrid Laurier University. We have three university students and a recent university graduate here to speak to students and others about a matter that concerns students in their role as students. The panelists will speak in the order I've introduced them. Each has eight minutes to state a position regarding the question, how free should the students be? I'll keep time and I'll signal when there's one minute remaining. After they've all stated a position, each panelist will have two minutes to respond to what the others have said. The panelists will then take questions from members of the audience. I'll move the microphone into the, uh, into the aisle. I'd like to thank the two sponsors of our discussion, St. Mary's University and the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship. The Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship is a national organization. Now in its 26th year, its mission includes to maintain freedom in teaching, research, and scholarship, and to maintain standards of excellence in academic decisions about students and faculty. I'd like particularly to thank Malcolm Butler, Vice President of Academic and Research at St. Mary's, for generously providing the wine and cheese reception. Right after the session here, do come join us, fourth floor of the Sobeys building, for food and drinks and to continue the conversation with our panelists. Our topic is broad and ill-defined. Each panelist will, of course, narrow it down to one of the two, one of the two matters that concerns them most. But let me try to articulate the general issue. Freedom contrasts with constraint, with the constraints of rules and policies backed up by sanctions and punishments, of course, but also the informal constraints of people's attitudes. Now, a student's life centrally involves classrooms and essays, but it involves much more formal and informal interactions with professors and other students, events both academic and social, art and music, campus newspapers, campus radio, the library, the cafeteria, clubs and societies, the hallways, the quad. I suppose the dorms fall on the side of home life and so are outside our discussion, but I'd be easy to persuade that they too count as places where students are still students. With each of these activities in each of these places comes rules and other constraints. The academic calendar contains both academic regulations and a student code of conduct. We have a safe and respectful St. Mary's initiative. The students, over, uh, the students Association oversees student societies and student media, and it vets postings on university walls. University officials monitor social media to see what students are saying about their professors and classmates and how they are saying it. Professors direct their teaching assistants. Those who favor minimal rules and minimal oversight in one or another area of student life and endeavor tend to say that rules and oversight get in the way of self-expression and self-determination, and moreover, tend to slow down the development in students of intellectual and moral autonomy. An intellectually and morally autonomous individual is one who believes and values for her own good reasons, and not out of fear of punishment or out of expectation of reward. If a university is to be a place at which students may develop into intellectually and morally autonomous people, then a university must be a place of freedom for students, even if students will sometimes use their freedom poorly. Freedom from constraint does not, of course, mean freedom from criticism. Those who say false or pernicious things or say what they say in a rough way can be criticized for doing so and shown better ways. 
In a place of freedom, when people reform their views or manners, they do so because they accept reasons for doing so, and not because they must or else fear punishment or sanction. Now, those, on the other hand, who favor strong rules and effective oversight worry about the effects on others of what students say and do. Certain views, even certain discussions, can belittle, disturb, and even scare some students and professors. That is, their presence in the air or on the walls can move students out of the frame of mind in which they can do their best work. Students don't feel at home. They don't feel that it's their university when these ideas and feelings are bandied about, especially if they are discussed dispassionately, academically. Freedom for students, then, can have academic and personal costs for many students. That's one of the worries. Another is that ideas and attitudes harmful to people will spread if those ideas and attitudes are allowed free expression and can be matters of dispassionate investigation and discussion. That a noxious idea has been refuted is no guarantee that it will go away, and its presence threatens to infect others, others who will act on it. We see this worry most clearly in, uh, in play in attempts by organized pro-choice groups to prevent the public discussion of abortion. On the other side then, well, sorry, on the one side then, we have people who see the university as a place for intellectuals to do what intellectuals do, that is to engage in investigation, interpretation, and discussion freely and for its own sake. On the other side are those who, while they might not despise intellectual life, are vividly aware of the dangers it creates, and who would then restrict and guide it so that it will serve other goals. An intellectual's university is a place of disputation where everything, including people's identities, is up for grabs in research and discussion. But, say others, some people's identities, at least at this time and in this place, should be celebrated, protected, not discussed critically. As well, they say, all university students are entitled to pursue a university education undistractedly and in their best frame of mind. Only then, they might add, will people from historically marginalized groups be able to take their places in the professional and elite world in anything near the proper proportion. Can these two sides find mutual ground to come to a resolution? Or do the fundamental conceptions of the nature and purpose of higher education differ so greatly between them that no compromise is possible? Now let us hear from our panelists. Russell. Thanks, Mark. Can everybody hear me? Um, I should begin by saying that I believe the topic of academic freedom is fairly simple. It is essentially the notion that we, as academics, should not be told what to say, and that we should be free to share our academic materials with the world through academic events and journals when they are of academic merit. Despite the simplicity of academic freedoms, the matters which I intend to discuss today are more complex, and so it will be difficult to cover all the ground that I want to in the time that I have. To overcome this, I've provided a couple of handouts for circulation, and um, one of which is a more detailed account of my views on this subject, and the other is an important piece of evidence to illustrate the problems which I will be discussing. After drawing from my own experiences, I will propose a potential solution. The first topic I will deal with involves a distinction between academics and pseudo-academics who are serving as political operatives. I should begin by drawing attention to the fact that as they stand today, academics are controlled. Governments control universities through means of funding and chartering, and professors are managed by administrators who hold their fate in their hands. Academics must publish in journals, which they do not control, and the list goes on. My main point here is that this control, which undermines academic freedom, has in fact been used to turn arts faculties into political rather than academic operations. The important thing to understand about pseudo-academics serving as political agents is that because of them, the academy now exists in such a way that its purpose is geared towards serving as a means to line students up behind politicians, who are the agents of major capitalists. The students are, of course, diverted from gaining an understanding of this fact and of other important matters. Now I will discuss my own recent encounter with this problem. During my previous semester here at SMU, I had submitted an abstract to present at a recent conference here called Playgrounds and Podiums, Contemporary Issues in Sport. The topic I had chosen to present was gender in sport, and I had taken the position that a gender categorization of athletes based on biological metrics was needed in order to ensure fairness of competition in competitive sport. I was given a very brief response saying that my submission could not be accepted, which didn't surprise me because I knew it was at odds with the politically correct views and other ideologies surrounding gender these days. When I asked why I had been refused, I got a very long-winded response, framing the conference as hyper-academic so as to justify rejecting my submission on the basis that it wasn't good enough. The organizer also criticized me for questioning why I had been rejected to begin with. The entire dialogue, as well as the abstract, is available in my handout. 
One of the main objections I raised was that an entirely non-academic political sports organization, a local roller derby, was allowed to present on the very same topic, but their presentation entirely lacked any research or empirical data. This was apparent also from their abstract, which was uploaded to the event's webpage, and the presentation itself was nothing more than a display of propaganda. The sharply worded exchange of emails between myself and the organizers is highly revealing of the corruption of the university in the sense in which I have been describing, where achievement of academic excellence is being compromised for the sake of propagating certain ideological and political views. My freedom to present my view in an academic context was suppressed for that reason. This sort of thing is just as objectionable in the arts as it would be if it were to happen in science. Imagine, for example, an astrophysics conference whose organizers decide to exercise their power to only allow astrologers to participate. This would undermine both the field of astrophysics and the academic freedom of researchers in that field, and all the more so if every conference and every academic journal were organized by the same kind of people, who are using their power as organizers to ruin the academy and destroy academic freedom. To attempt to refute this, the concept of academic freedom must be applied very simplistically. In my own case, when I sought help in dealing with the suppression of my view at the recent conference, I was told that the organizers were acting within the boundaries of their own academic freedom, which entitles them to decide which views they want to include. I was told that although my abstract may have been rejected for bad reasons, it was not an issue of academic freedom. Now, of course, sometimes decisions must be made because people have to be cut when there are simply too many applicants, although this was probably not the case in my situation. And of course, rejection is something that has to occur in academia at times. However, if in doing so, the organizing group unilaterally suppresses one particular view in favor of political reasons, this cannot be defended as an exercise of academic freedom because it is not academic to do that. Scientists are not free to publish rubbish in the name of academic freedom because it is a freedom that must be exercised responsibly. What good is the academic freedom of economists if the only ones chosen to speak in academic fora are selected for their willingness, for their willingness to tell lies about the economy? Freedom of expression, as well as academic freedom, are reduced to nonsense if a person is not allowed to address those who need to be addressed. One thing I learned from my experience of having my academic work rejected in favor of propaganda is that we clearly need to have a better understanding of what rules are actually operative in academic discipline and about what rules ought to apply. It is simply outrageous to defend the power of people to suppress well-founded con contributions to a subject and to put an academic veneer on propaganda and ideology, which was predominantly the case at the Playground of Podium's conference. The last topic I will discuss is now a solution-based proposal. In examining the restrictions imposed on academic freedom, we must also focus on the course system itself, combined with the failure to separate teaching from evaluation of students. A failure to have such a distinction muddles actual learning progress with other abilities, such as the ability to cram for an exam, regurgitation, memorization of uninteresting facts, knowing what kind of answers your professor will like, and etc. We can look for the methods of Oxbridge to see how to provide better for academic freedom of the students within the structure of their education. Tutors are chosen by the students, and they only argue rationally with the student. They do not award grades. There are no courses. The student is free to use any methods to achieve competence in his or her chosen field, and does not know in advance who the examiners will be, nor who will be evaluating him or her at the end of their period of study. By virtue of how the system works, the student cannot pander to the examiners, and the examiners cannot be expected to be pandered to, so both have to rely on rational criteria, which is what the educational systems and judgments of academic merit should be based on, as opposed to criteria which are influenced by ideology and politics. Thank you for your time. Mark Keller. Okay. Um, so Mark talked a little bit about how academic freedom for students isn't just about what goes on on campus, that it covers what's off campus, it covers social clubs, basically every aspect of the life of a student at a university. I focused more on the classroom here um, for my little opening remarks, but I think there'll be a lot of time during the question period to sort of get a little more specific on things. Uh, so, to begin, much like a discussion of freedom of speech, the discussion of academic freedom is never about justifying complete unfettered freedom for students, for that would be impossible to defend without rendering the point of schooling useless. If students were completely free and unfettered by any constraints, then it would follow that if they should so choose, they could pass in a crayon drawing of a person for their fourth year biology course and expect to pass or even do well. This, of course, is ridiculous. So the discussion must necessarily be one about how constrained students should be and about what principles we should use to determine which constraints are appropriate and which are inappropriate. I agree with Mark that the issues concerning how much freedom students should have almost always comes down to differences concerning the nature and purpose of a university. 
So I'd like to begin by outlining my conception of what a university should be and end with some of the ramifications that this has concerning academic freedom for students. <coughs> Firstly, I believe that a university should hold a unique place in our educational system. That is, primary, elementary, and secondary schools, which are provided for by the federal and provincial governments, already cover the basics of the education of a person. And there are many colleges which people may choose to attend and serve the end of preparing its students for a variety of vocations. Surely no one would argue that a graduate of primary or elementary or secondary school was educated simply by virtue of having graduated from these schools and no other, which leaves unanswered the question of how to complete this project, how to create educated people. I believe that this is the unique position that a university should occupy to fulfill the project of successful education by fostering the development of educated persons. What I'm talking about here is what is typically referred to as the liberal model of university education. Now, when I say liberal, I mean a form of education that liberates the mind from the bondage of habit and custom, which stems from the Roman and Stoic notions of education in general. So I don't mean liberal in a political sense. A university that aims to educate and not simply train its students must then foster an environment that is conducive to the sort of teaching and learning that liberates the minds of its students rather than constraining them. A program that does the latter is not an institution of education, but rather an institution of indoctrination. The purpose of a university should not be to prepare its graduates for some specific vocation, nor should it be to endow them with the basic knowledge and life skills, for there are already schools that assume this role. One cannot educate in order to liberate the minds of others by narrowly focusing or on honing one set of skills or transmitting one narrowly defined body of knowledge, as these schools tend to. This means that universities need to offer a range of courses that span the whole gamut of human knowledge. And it follows that if progress is to be made, if the stores of knowledge that scholars, students, and society at large draw from is to be enlarged, then scholars and students must be permitted to examine any view that avails itself to epistemic justification. The only way to avoid turning a university into an institution of vocational training, or worse, an institution of indoctrination, is that professors, students, and administrators dedicate themselves to continually re-examine re any view to either bolster the justification for it, or falsify it and move towards justifying a view that is more likely to be true. So if I'm right about the university occupying the unique role of successfully completing the formal education process by liberating the minds of its students, in short, by educating them, and it seems to fall that certain constraints should be placed on both faculty and students alike. Michael Upshaw reminds us that the university is a place where students have the opportunity of education and conversation with their teachers, their fellows, and themselves, and where they are not encouraged to confuse education with training for a profession. So at the very least, university administrators, professors, and students need to foster an environment where professors are allowed the freedom to teach as their expertise dictates, and for students to question those views without fear of reprisal for that very questioning. This entails wide latitude in allowing students to express their views, whatever they may be. <coughs> However, there may be times where expressing these views no longer becomes conducive to teaching well, a time when the discussion strays too far away from the subject at hand or becomes too personal, and professors need to be empowered to shut down such discussions, recenter the discussion, or change the focus of the discussion unit or course accordingly. The freedom to be free from reprisal from administrators for holding certain views and with it the responsibility to ensure that such expression does not systematically preclude the rest of the class from participating in the discussion or from learning at all. For lack of a better way to put it, reason and truth become the censors of the university classroom. To be sure, what I'm saying is that by challenging the views of their professors and their fellow students, students may come to see that there is more to such a view than they previously thought. Or they may find that the justification they have for believing their professor's or fellow student's view is wrong is not sufficiently justified, and that more evidence is required before they can mount a proper defense of their own view. And if we systematically preclude certain views from being able to be expressed, either by formal or informal means, we run the risk of violating those principles that are central to the liberal model for university education. If certain views cannot be expressed in class, it may follow from that that there are certain views that cannot or should not be researched, and accordingly that certain truths remain hidden and concealed from the light of reason. That is something an institution of indoctrination takes as one of its central values, and not something a liberal university or any educational institution should about. Thank you. Have notes in front of me, so <laughs> well, it, should be, yeah. <laughs> it should be fun. 
so as Mark mentioned, I'm the president here of the Student Association. Uh, and uh, I'm here actually to listen more than to speak today, uh, to listen to students' uh, issues and concerns and uh, how do they feel inside the classroom. And since we do represent the students uh, uh, with the university and with the administration, and that's where we can go to the university and tell them this is how our students are being treated. Uh, on the other side, I want to talk uh, a bit about the Student Association and uh, how we oversee. And as uh, Mark mentioned, you know, as a Student Association, we oversee our 50 plus societies on campus. And uh, one of the important things uh, you mentioned is the posters are on campus. And, uh, and this is one of the things I want to talk a bit about. And uh, some of you might have heard about this, but uh, six years ago now, and in 2012, uh, there was a poster out there that has a gun on it. So a poster that have a gun on it, and uh, this poster came up to the student association to be stamped because uh, whenever we put a poster out around campus, you need to stamp it from the student association. Uh, at that time, uh, there was a shooting in one of the schools around 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 the area, and that's where uh, us as a student association we look at the perspective around us when when we see a poster that have a gun on it. Uh, now, did we, did we tell the students to take the posters down? And the question is, do we have the right to tell the students to take the posters down? We stand posters. Uh, we might do have the right. Uh, have we ever done it? I don't think so. Uh, what happened in 2012, and uh, that's, uh, uh, that's where a discussion I want to see from it later on, uh, where a student have a gun uh, in the poster that say, join us in a society poster. And what the student association asked them for, uh, why don't you know, there was a shooting this week, and you know, this might be something that has a dash with violence. Is there a way we can remove the gun, or is there a way we can put the gun aside so it's just not pointing at students? And we know it's the freedom of students to create the posters they want and what they believe is right, and, and that's where it comes when it comes to Canvas and their uh, academic freedom on Canvas. Uh, so we ask, and part of the academic freedom is having a discussion. That's the important part because if you say no right away, that means you are against academic freedom right away, I will tell you, because part of academic freedom, if it was outside the classroom or inside the classroom, is the opportunity to have a discussion on it. So at that time we had a discussion and they didn't like the discussion. So right away uh, they, they didn't want to change it or they didn't want to stand it at that time. And you know, they went to the media and said, you know, the student association asked us to take our poster down. You know, and that's where, uh, and I want to hear later from you, what should we do at that time? When, when it comes to us as, as a student association, as an organization, when every poster gets go, it's going to go up, you know, uh, is it, and that's where we go back to the main point. Is if, if a poster gets someone offended, do we say no, like this shouldn't be up? Of course not, because you may see many posters that might get other students offended on campus uh, for a specific, but if there's a poster that uh, it's related or endorse hate speech. That's a poster where you say no, because you can't say, for example, on a poster, you know, Islam and Christian are not religions, are not the right religion. You can do that on a poster and both come. But you know what? You can say Islam and let's let's have a debate on if Islam and Christian are right, right, uh, religious, you know? And that's where we stand in the middle as a student association when it comes to our posters policy, when it comes to our society. You know, our societies have the freedom to do whatever they want. You know, they want to do events on campus, off campus, they have the right of freedom to do whatever they want. When it comes to the student association, we make sure first of their liability, you know? They have the, the freedom to do an event they like, uh, uh, a theme they like, maybe a theme that other people wouldn't like, you know? A theme like when Trump was running for elections, you know? Some people were like, that's offended. Why would someone do an event? But if a society came up with their students and they want to do an event, you know, we, we, we don't, it's not about support or not support, but it's a society and they, they have the freedom to do that in, in many ways. Uh, so that's where we fall as a student association around campus. And especially when you see the posters panel around campus, it's, it's kind of a channel of the university. It's, kind, it's the same as social media. It's the same as uh, the university uh, website. It's the same as different, because it's a channel that reaches students around campus. And that's where we look what's the right thing to be, to have out there, and what's the limit of the academic freedom for this? Or should we say, you know what, everyone can put whatever they want up there, we're not judging anyone. And it's not about judging, it's about making sure that what's up there is, is not the, it's not the right thing I want to say, but it's not the thing that might really get people on the other side.
offended, offensive, and feel that this canvas is not welcome for them because, uh, as we know, uh, this canvas has been working for many years to, to make it an inclusive canvas for all our students here, if it was from day one welcome week or, or in their fourth year. And so that's the area uh, I'm expert in. After listening for both of you, I, I was like, I wish I'm a philosophy or <laughs> I did some courses at least. Uh, but in general, uh, I would like to hear more about you and uh, how you feel here on our campus and inside <coughs> our classroom and uh, off campus if it's related to the school. Thank you. freedom for students on the other side of the country, so uh, at the University of British Columbia, UBC. And something they're doing right now is they're coming up with a statement on freedom of expression, and they're going to institute this statement. And it, it makes sense to do this, because Canadian campus culture has kind of become synonymous with you know, platforming, um, stifling debate, silencing discussion. So it, it makes sense to institute something like this. Um, so. When they put out their draft statement, um, they, they allowed for feedback, and there's actually over 100 comments online um, that you can read. And I went through over 100 of them, and um, it, it's really mixed reviews. And so here's the most contentious phrase, I'll read it for you. <clears throat> One person's freedom of expression cannot be allowed to trample the freedom and well-being of others. So the issue that, that people took up with this is well-being. It's such a subjective, contentious term, right? It, it could mean anything. Um, and, and so why it matters is, so there's a professor at Wilfrid Laurier University named uh, David Haskell, and he has come up with the term linguistic imperialism. And it, what this means is that, so when you have a, a certain segment of society, um, that, that it leans politically and ideologically one way. They're, they're trying to redefine words in a way that suits their worldview um, and it conveys their worldview. So if we think of words such as mentally harmed, uh, psychologically disturbed, unsafe space, trauma, violence, um, they're trying to loosen the definition so much that the, the power is taken away from these words. And so, <clears throat> Another, another way this is relevant, so as I said, I went through over 100 of, of the comments in, in response to UBC's draft statement, and um, there's one in particular that, that stood out to me, and I'll read this for you as well. <clears throat> the pro-life group that was set up outside the nest for a week, and the nest is the student commons at UBC, should absolutely not be allowed to do so. I felt uncomfortable and scared to go to school for a week as a result. Students should never, capital letters, never, feel unsafe at their own place of education. So it's, it's loaded with an educational philosophy, sure, but what, what stood out to me was this, this person is scared to go to school for a week simply because of a pro-life display. And, and I'm not a psychologist, obviously, but, you know, as a human being as, and with experience interacting with other human beings, it's, it's not a normal response, right? And, and um, <clears throat> so John, John, Jonathan Haidt uh, from the Heterodox Academy, he, he kind of says that in 2015 there was a coalescing of many factors that, that led to this kind of campus culture. So it's, it's a victimhood culture, it's a virtue signaling culture, um, changes in parenting, um, it, it led to less independent youth, as well as a kind of political and ideological monoculture of left-leaning faculty on campuses. Um, <clears throat> so, the reason why I care about UBC's statement is because my university, Wilfrid Laurier, is, is going to come out with um, with, with a similar kind of project. So, and of course this was inspired by um, the events that, that transpired between me and the university. So I was accused of being transphobic um, under the gendered and sexual violence policy for having a discussion about gender pronouns. 
Okay, and so <clears throat> we need to think about the hierarchy of policies. So let's say Laurier made a statement of, uh, of thank you. Laurier made a statement that endorsed maximum freedom of expression. Okay, <clears throat> and um, and let's say this was instituted when I showed the clip that I did in my class. Well, at the same time, we still have the gendered and sexual violence policy. So, you know, which one would come first? Even if you say that, that an objectionable idea cannot be silenced, if you still have a gendered and sexual violence policy, would I still be accused under it? And so what I'm getting at here is, is something like sexual politics can become pro-censorship, right? And this manifests in another way as well, so also at Laurier. Um, Daniel Robitaille, who is a lawyer who defended Gian Gomeshi uh, in the sexual assault lawsuit, um, she was invited by Laurier's Criminology Students Association to come speak. Um, but there, there was an adv advocacy group, um, I think it was something about students for a culture of consent on campus, and they petitioned for her to not come. And so she ended up not coming. Um, they, were, they were successful in, in objecting to her presence because her presence would be too triggering. So, <clears throat> again, what I'm getting at here is academic freedom for students. Even if you have a statement of, of freedom of expression, it might not mean anything if the pro-censorship policies are hidden within other legal frameworks and in other regulations. So that's what we need to look out for. that we had, but uh, I, now I'm just going to speak a bit more generally about academic freedom. So in the absence of a fundamental basis of academic freedom, I think that bold thinking is discouraged and the stagnations of ideas are promoted in the classroom. If a student were to present a view on a politically charged topic which challenges the view that is deemed politically acceptable according to their institutions, they may often be subject to criticism which is not academic or just an entire dismissal of their idea altogether. And this can be devastating to the student who works hard and produces high quality work, which is undervalued, unfairly criticized, and marked with a poor grade as a result of its lack of conformity to the ideolo ideological or political stances which are being encouraged. As a result of controlled learning conditions, and in conjunction with the largely unchanged structure of our classical education system, most students cannot, or neglect to, get beyond regurgitating what they remember being taught. And uh, the, the carefully executed limitations imposed on academic freedom are responsible for the, the present state of the academy, which, you know, I believe to be, the, has become the epicenter of ideological and political indoctrination in developed societies. Um, you know, uh, I think that the this should also be the way that in which decisions are made regarding the, the selection of materials to be presented at academic conferences uh, with regard to the solution that I proposed about um, separating the teaching from the evaluation of students. I think that if that were the case, then, you know, if it started in the university, it would extend to, to all academic fora, you know? Uh, and, and one other thing that I wanted to talk about is something that I think every, every student here can probably agree with me about is examinations suck. And, and I think the, the, one of the main reasons for that is because actually they, they are exerting a, a severe limitation on our academic freedom. Examination papers drastically reduce the student's academic freedom by requiring that certain books and certain specific topics be studied. And, and thus, you know, if, if an institution wanted to accommodate academic freedom through their examinations, they, they would want to make their questions be general enough to, to accommodate very different study choices. And uh, however, this is not the way things are usually done in institutions where academic freedom is misunderstood or undervalued. Uh, thank you. Mark, two minutes to uh, respond to what you've heard from your fellow panelists. Um, yeah, so I'll, I want to focus on the, the comment from the student of the, the pro-life 
demonstrators. And I think it's a, a good example of, of what scares me about where universities are headed in the sense that it is a perfectly defensible view to say that you know, either A, abortion shouldn't be permitted, um, or that there is something morally wrong with abortion in the same way that it is perfectly sensible and defendable to hold that it should be permitted, and that may not be, that it may be, uh, I don't know if it is, I don't know how easy it is to defend that it's morally yeah. right, but, yeah. who's going to not permit it, you? I, I have no idea, just, mm. okay, there'll be some good. time for questions at the end, cool. thank oh, you. Okay, yeah. Yeah. What scares me about it is that instead of engaging with it, it seems like disengagement has become more of the norm, where instead of going in and having a conversation with these people, avoidance becomes the norm. And that's what scares me. If We're not avoiding anything. We're right here. If, if you'd like to come up and... No, okay. we want Thank to do what you're saying. So what scares me is that if we start to avoid certain subjects, whether that's in class or start to police, whether it's clubs for not being able to discuss certain things or have clubs about certain things, what scares me is that you end up with too many people that don't want to engage, that retreat to the people who believe like them and only like them. Well, oh, oh sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Must be a Marxist plot. <laughs> so, you know, I think the more open we are, especially at, at the classroom level, in presenting these views, the more discussions we can have on them, the more exposure you get to all the views that you will find out there in the world, I think the better we are as citizens in general, and the better off we are as graduates by the time we're done here. And I think that the more and more we start to constrain it, the worse and worse off we are as people and graduates in general. Osama. Great. So uh, I will disagree and, di and disagree at the same time. So I will agree with you about uh, being more open to get people more engaged, and especially when it comes uh, to clubs and societies. And uh, if it comes to me, and I have been two or three years on, on, on the student association, uh, board and we never turn the society away. We would never, uh, whatever name they came up with, we would never tell them you are not allowed to use this name. It's not even our policy, you know, that you need to use the appropriate name. And when I speak to this, I speak about when it comes to the religious society or non-religious society, to the pol to political society, as long as they are following uh, the criteria that all societies are following equally. Uh, that's uh, that's the point of it. Where uh, to be always open and always welcome to new societies to engage more uh, people on this campus. I'll disagree about the examination thing, uh, examination part where uh, I will agree as a student, you know, it's fun, <laughs> we don't need exams, and exams are not fun parts for the whole time of the year. Uh, but uh, what will be the second option if there's no examination? Because from my perspective, I'm, I, I'm an international student here whom I came from countries doesn't really have the freedom of speech like here. But uh, I would say from all the papers I have wrote, if it was in psychology, if it was in commerce, if it was, uh, I wrote my own things, I wrote uh, my own perspective, I did my own research, and I never got the professors to tell me, you're not allowed to talk on this, or uh, this is not the right thing to write about. I might not get the mark I want to, but I believe I did write what I wanted. And that was part of the uh, academic freedom, I would say. Uh, and and uh, yeah, that's for me. In fact, I can just quickly respond yeah. to that. There are alternatives to examinations for evaluating students, and I discussed some of that when I was talking about the methods yeah. employed at Oxford, if you can recall. Yeah. Lindsay, two minutes to respond to what you've heard from the other panelists. Yeah, sure. So, yeah. Uh, and maybe some of these things will be picked up more in the question and answer period. Um, to Russell, to what you were saying, um, when you say that, that pseudo academics are working as political operatives, I would challenge you on, on providing perhaps more more evidence, like more cases. You've provided your own. Mm -hmm. But you know, I think it, it would need to be further elaborated on. Um, and then to Mark, of course, you know, when you say that avoidance is becoming the norm over over engaging with people, I mean I can't agree more. 
right? We, we need to have dialogue. We need to be able to see where other people are coming from. And that's maybe not necessarily an academic freedom for students thing, but just an understanding each other as people thing and just being honest with each other and being curious about each other. Um, so that just appeals to humanity. Um, and then to Osana. Um, <coughs> So you, were you arguing that, that you shouldn't put up a poster that says Christianity and Islam are the wrong religion? Are the wrong? Or are they're, they're not the right religions? Is that what you were saying? Yeah, you yeah. shouldn't be able to put up a poster? No, you, you should be able to have a debate about it, saying let's have a debate that Islam and Islam shouldn't say it's, it's wrong right away. Well, it's I would disagree. I mean, if you're, I would say, you know, you can put up that poster. And, and then by virtue of putting it up, maybe then the debate and the discussion arises, right? What about if it really didn't create that debate, or wasn't really a debate, you just want to put it as, as you feel that? Well, I think they should be allowed to do so. Yeah. If I could elaborate quickly on uh, the distinction between academics and political operatives, I think it's useful to draw another distinction between knowledge and ideology. See, knowledge is you know, claims and descriptions about reality which are devised in an attempt to be extremely accurate to reality. Ideology is similar insofar as its claims and descriptions about reality. However, these ones are different insofar as they're not devised to be accurate, but rather to serve other political means such as manipulate people or line them up between behind politicians and etc. So I would argue that an academic is really a pseudo-academic serving as a political operative when they are teaching ideology as opposed to teaching knowledge. Thank you. Let's thank our panelists. I'll set up our microphone. Please come to the mic if you have a question. Eva, yes. Christina. Uh, thank you all for some very interesting, stimulating comments. Uh, my question is for for some. Yes. Do you mean? Okay. Um, I would like to hear a little bit about where you are actually originally coming from. How does your experience of academic freedom, of freedom to <coughs> express yourself, compare to that in Canada? Also, how is, for instance? Um, opposition to some view handled in your country? Would it be in your country, for instance, uh, perfectly fine to talk about the abortion issue? Those kind of things. Thank you for your question. Now that, that's a really good question. Uh, I came kind of from uh, the Middle East and uh, uh, kind of from a closed society, I would say, a, clo a closed society uh, driven by religion, most usually, if it was any any part of religion, it's uh, usually it's all, uh, by religion and you know, having that transition between coming from the Middle East all the way to Canada and uh, how a free country is Canada, it's, it's, it's a bit of an experience and it's, it's always, I would say, uh, there's always a learning process for it, it's always, you always learn something in, in new actually and uh, when I actually was doing my research on academic freedom and, and you, you get to know more about uh, faculty and more about students and uh, when uh, Russell mentioned something about administration, you realize with time that administration doesn't really have that power of faculty. Faculty have their paper of collective agreement that that's what they are with and that's where uh, you got shocked as, as, as a student or as, a, as someone coming from outside because you always believe that deans have the power to make anything they want. They always, we always have and believe that the president of the university is the president. If he say this is wrong, this is wrong, and that's and that's um being honest, kind of where uh, uh, where how it is. Where when you come here and uh, you see how things work, it's totally different uh, when it comes to for sure uh, being union and non-union, uh, when it comes to human rights and uh, what are you allowed to say and what you're not allowed to say. And it's, 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 a pretty, it's a pretty challenge and it's a culture to learn. It's a culture to learn about our uh, indigenous students on campus. It's a culture to learn about our LGBTQ plus on campus. You know, we came from a culture where you, know, where you came here, uh, uh, you, you feel like they are all part of us where you never thought that. And that's where you wake up a bit, you say like, what if my friend is gay? Where in the past, where I would never thought my friend is gay, where my best friend is gay and my other best friend is lesbian. So that's that's amazing. And I would go back and tell my parents that. I would tell my 
my my my family that because that's how it is here and that's how free you can be here and that that's a learning process and it's it's just great to see where where you came from and where you are so yeah that's my um. yes please. hi yes um, um, I think the uh, for me like listening to all of you was very interesting but but the one term that came from you um, that really stuck out and, and to me. Um, it's around this term that sent the, the whole issue of freedom of expression centers, and that's the rational factor. Like, if we really, re if we, I find like, um, and I know there, there, there's this term like uh, people are getting triggered, right? Like certain words, and boy, the emotion flies. And we have seen that here too, you know? I mean, um, <laughs> triggered as fuck. Triggered as fuck. Yep. And, like, the rational factor. We are here to discuss things. Our whole society, Western society, is built on the rational factor. That was the enlightenment. That's what it was about. Mm. We got away from burning witches at the stake because at one point they really believed it. Um, you know, and so so it has developed. And, and, uh, and so, for instance, when, when it was said, well, academic freedom cannot be anything because uh, you know, then it could be like uh, crayon paintings. No, that's not even the issue, crayon paintings. It's because crayon paintings are not rational. It's the rational factor. So, so it really doesn't matter like what the issue is. If you go with it, with your mind, with, then, then, then it should be able to be dealt with because, because it's innate in us to know what the truth is. And we know when we lie to each other. So, so um, uh, that, that's that's one thing. Just like, and then I want to say um, with this uh, what what Lindsay was saying about um, you know like these terms and people are getting so sensitive and sp you save spaces and um, for instance at Harvard and that's true and that's um, uh, there is uh, Harvard Law School. The term rape cannot be used. And in law school, the whole thing, uh, rape, yeah, because it triggers women. So there you have lawyers now being, being, um, being uh, uh, educated at Harvard, one of the elite schools, and they won't have a clue about rape because they can't deal with it. So this is where we are getting to. Like this is Harvard, and they are setting an example. Next time we can't say whatever, and then what's left? So what I think is, um, and the same with the issue with, uh, can I be for this religion or not? Let's talk it out rationally. But you see, what I think what's happening is that people just get it, it, it emot they're so emotionally that it gets, you know, it, it, the whole issue, um, I don't know, then it becomes like, who has a lot of voice? But Thanks. Um, yeah. I, 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 I'm going like, to let Mark uh, begin, because you, you re referred to a point that he made, but I think, uh, I think he misunderstood his point. Oh, okay. Mark? Because uh, you're against, you do say, no crayons. Yes, that's right. No, no, no. No, I understood <laughs> that. No, I, I just wanted to say, I just wanted to say the, the um, to juxtapose crayon, painting to free academic freedom wasn't quite right. I know where you were, but because because that's out of the academic realm. You know, as long as things are academic, I think they should be allowed. And you know, I know I come but, from No, let's let uh, let's right. Mark, Mark. Uh, so but that's like if we're talking about you know constraints that we place upon students, that's that's one of them. One of the constraints is you cannot simply write about Okay, so let's, let's just take the, the biology class example. As a student in a biology class, the constraints that are placed upon you have to do with that discipline in general. So that doesn't mean that you can't write about, oh, I don't know, uh, some political matter, so long as it can be tied into whatever the assignment was. If the assignment was to talk about the human digestive system, sure, maybe there's an analogy in there to some political issue, uh, something pithy, but you know, if you hand in a paper that's more appropriate in a political science classroom, you shouldn't expect to get a passing mark for that because you just wrote a political science. No, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? So like, yeah. that, that's what I'm saying, is that simply by virtue of being a student, you agree to there being certain constraints on what you can and can't do insofar yeah. as what you can write about. But, you know, if, if 
if we're talking about biology and you wanted to write a paper, if there was an open assignment, write a paper on something related to what we talked about this year, and you wanted to write a paper on why you don't believe that our conception of the sexes are appropriate, that there are only males and only females, absolutely. But it can't be pure conjecture. You're going to have to find evidence to justify your view. You're going to, and maybe to your point there, have to speak better rationally. And same thing if you wanted to take the opposing view. I just wanted to quickly touch on your point about the word rational, because I agree with you that it is a key word here. And I think there are two uh, distinct interpretations of the word rational which come into play. The first of which is the one that we should be working with in a university, where rational means well-founded or well-reasoned. Now, the second of which is another applicable meaning of the word rational means something more to the effect of in line with our goals, right? We could say that something was rational if it was in line with our goals. Now, lots of the things that we might be teaching in university are rational in the sense that they're in line with some goal, but that doesn't mean that they are well-founded or well-reasoned and should be part of the curriculum or the syllabus. Yes, that, so, so when I mean rational, it was, of course, more like logical, right? And I, and I, I know, for instance, that in the past, at universities, well, well, uh, logic, just one, okay, one, very one, quickly. Very quickly. Um, the, the course in philosophy, logic, was actually mandatory, and there used to be full auditoriums. Sorry, uh, full auditoriums. Uh, but now, nobody wants to take logic anymore. And I think, in order to solve these problems, I think logic should become mandatory again, and then we can talk about it. But Sam, did you want to respond to these remarks? No. Okay, okay. Lindsay, did you have anything to add? No. Yes, please. Okay, um, my name is Ifo, I am Useko. Some people from Europe thought that it was rational to invade, kidnap, enslave, and bring people to this land. Then they thought that it was rational to commit genocide on indigenous peoples. Then they thought that it was rational to set up residential schools. And right now we have more native kids in care in this country than they did in the height of residential school. So if this is the example of a bastion of rational, I want irrational. <laughs> Now, tied into that idea of Western nationality is the idea of Nazi ideology. Oh, the idea Woo! that there is one way that is supreme, oh. which is usually the white way, and then whatever it is that people say that are from different cultural backgrounds or understanding and are considered irrational or infantile. Like when our ancestors talked about the need to, to respect the earth and to love each other and that we're all brothers and sisters and that we're all family. White people, still today, consider that irrational and childish, which is why there's so much money in the Western world spent on weapons of mass destruction, like Halifax is, is manufacturing weapons to kill people. So I don't want you guys to talk about rational until the West becomes rational. Okay. So I, have, I, have a, uh, I just have to respond to that because that was fundamental white supremacy. So now, um, the thought, you can discuss issues of rape without act or sexual assault in one way. So that is actually logically incorrect. Now, my question is this. You talk about freedom. People that enslave people like me are talking about freedom. You haven't paid reparations yet. You haven't returned the land that you're stolen. How can you talk about freedom? Well, let's get more precise. Freedom for white people would mean that Nazis can freely organize in St. Mary's and put up posters so they can continue to hunt people that look like me. That's not freedom. The same way freedom comes responsibility. What the white alt-white wants is freedom without responsibility. You're not responsible for the shit that you say. And when we come to actually have logical questions for you about the implications of what you're saying, or the fact that the alt-right and all these Nazi groups are following you in masses, you're like, hey, we have nothing to do with it. So you need to check yourself before you write yourself. So my question is, what is your response to the fact that the stuff that you're saying that you think is rational and good for the betterment of society is, re is, is leading to people like me being under increasing attack from the alt-right, from the proud boys, from the people who did shit in, in the States, from all this nonsense. I have to ask you, where is your responsibility for the stuff that you're putting out and what it's doing to this society that you claim to be free? And I want to hear you. Russell,
be honest, I think your view is precisely the result of an absence of rationality in our education system. <laughs> So I'm going to ask you to answer logically. Let's even use Western European logic to inspire you. Hold on, I'm going to help you. You, you say it's free though. You're getting triggered. I'm getting scared. Chill out. Yeah, right. so, so can you answer the question logically? Scared. Is there anything that I said that was incorrect? So, Again, I think that... The, no, just, one, just say one thing that I said that was incorrect. I think that the view that you hold is a result of bullshit, ideological bullshit, sciences bullshit, that are ingrained in the, in the education system. Okay, so obviously you can't answer it because I'm there a new Western response to the nonsense that you're saying. Other panelists? Is that your response? Yeah, I mean, the things you say, I completely agree that they're horrendous. Who doesn't? And... You know, proud boys alt right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I disavow what they do, and and so when you do say you that, that that like that I, I heard what you I said she did, why did I ever talk? Like so, ever in a public setting besides today. Yeah, oh, someone might be like someone Facebook and live. Say so you denounce the Mike Sonovich and quiet, the Proud please. Boys. Let's, let, let's like, say you denounce them right now. Say it. Okay. So, just going back to what you were saying earlier, in, so in, in the eight minutes of, of what I said, what did you find about it that, that appeals to the alt-right or that would, that would appeal to those groups and incite violence? You're seriously asking that question after the number of followers that you have? No, no, what, what I just said now. Why are we talking about what I, what I just said? At the oh, you responded to Osama when he talked about the need for have, to have respectful freedom, which means love, right? So if you know something is fundamentally hurtful to somebody else, the loving response, if you're a decent human being, that your, that your parents taught you how to respect other people, is not to willingly do stuff that you know will incite hatred or will lead to the death of people like me. That's if you're a decent human being. Now, if you want to argue that rationality is Nazi ideology, you should just kill people if you feel like killing people, that's a different conversation. And if that is your stance and you stand with the Nazis, that's okay, at least be honest. But don't be disingenuous and say this stuff. Because you're not a two year old, you know what you're saying. Next. If you claim that you're rational. Next question, please. Apparently, I'm not. Well, you didn't she, she did. Question. No, no, no. She said, she asked me what was it that was problematic, yeah. and I told her exactly what it was was your response to Osama that you just want freedom to do whatever you want, including inciting the children of people like me. That is the logical conclusion. So you're talking about logic. No. The, uh, so, so can you answer the question? We have Nazi Twitter followers. Can you answer the question? Nazi Twitter followers. Nazi Twitter followers. Yes. 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 Who's stepping in her defense? Nazi Twitter Saluting in her defense. Quiet, please. Let's... Doesn't matter. Let's Lindsay, do you have anything to say, or shall we move on? I'm not a Nazi, and I don't like Nazis, and I disavow what they do. And I don't Next, no, no. Well, there's no winning there. What are you talking about? Um, my question is um, directed towards the comments on um, how we're becoming a culture of avoidance. Um, so, in response to the example that you used um, of pro-lifers protesting, um, let's say for example on campus or you know, somewhere public, like a facility or a school, um, although I agree that these conversations are something that needs to happen, I feel like they need to happen in a safe space and where people are willing to be vulnerable enough to talk about these things. If we allow people to come and make that kind of protest and tell people what they are and are not allowed to do with their bodies, make them feel attacked and oppressed, they are not going to feel comfortable. They are going to feel in danger. 
And if someone is feeling in danger, how do you expect them to have a rational conversation with somebody? If someone is coming up to me and telling me that I don't have rights to my own body, that I don't get to decide what to do with my body should I become pregnant, I feel endangered, I feel oppressed, and I feel attacked. And that is not a place that I can be to have any kind of conversation with someone that is going to result in anything positive. Yeah, no, I, I don't necessarily disagree with that, but what I wonder is, can the classroom be that place? Well, that depends on who we have facilitating it. Yeah, I would agree. And I think, I think what that speaks to more than anything is that just because you've got a PhD, just because you are incredibly knowledgeable, and I assure you, in order to end up at that place, you have to be, doesn't mean you're going to be a good teacher. Yeah. And if there is something we can do to make the classroom, you know, when I say a safe place, I don't mean a place free from offense or feeling uncomfortable. I think that that's part and parcel of what it means to be able to talk about these things. But you're right, I think it does take the right kind of person to do that. I think it takes a good teacher to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. I want the classroom to be that place, but it does mean that it's going to put you in a position where you're going to have to have that uncomfortable conversation. And what I, and, and that's, that is what I want, not because I want you to feel endangered or anybody for that matter regarding any subject matter. It's because this is not a view that, that we are necessarily going to get rid of. There's, there are so many political and moral things tied up with abortion. You're always going to have somebody who thinks that, it, maybe even on rational grounds, that it should not be permitted. But I think by allowing that to come to the fore in the classroom, you get to see one of two things. Number one, that your opponents, the people with whom you disagree, might actually have a good point or two. Or number two, your opponents believe, not on the basis of, of evidence, but believe on the basis of a whole variety of other things. Maybe it's tied in with their family's beliefs. Maybe it's tied in with their religious beliefs. So it's not just that they believe these things or refuse refuse to believe that you're right or refuse to agree with your position on abortion on evidential grounds they do it because if they repudiate those things they repudiate their family their friends all of the things that they take value take to be valuable in this world so the argument becomes a heck of a lot more difficult because now it's going to be tar hard to try and dissuade them of that view because it's based on so many other things than just evidence. Right. At the very least, you get a chance to see what is behind this view that you disagree with. Right. Stop, we'll stop. But we're not talking about apples and oranges here. We're talking about people's existence. Mm -hmm. And when we set up a platform where we, allowed, where we allow alt-right fascists and Nazis allowed to yeah. perpetuate yeah. hate speech and gather more followers. Yeah, I think the question's been asked. I, I want to hear if uh, Osama and uh, Lindsay have, have responses. No? Uh, but Osama, can I ask, what if a pro-life group wanted to organize among the students and wanted to demonstrate if, on if, campus? If I would, I would agree with you in having a safe place. This, this university should be a safe place and a welcome place for the 7,000 students who are here. Uh, if these discussions inside the classroom will really uh, make students, and I'm not talking about make students offended and or they don't like the, the topic of it, but if it's really going to make them uh, uh, feel that they're not safe up to be in this university, that means I'm not sure where is the other place to be safe other than home. So uh, well, it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be there in classroom. Um, it makes students unsafe. Uh, Russell, what's well? I mean, what we're basically talking about here is just whether or not people should be able to present a view on something. Uh, it happens to be abortion in this case, and I can recall in grade ten, you know, we we staged debates about a variety of topics, including abortion, and nobody got upset. You know, it was simply an exercise in argumentation. 
So what I want to suppose here is, can we not expect a higher degree of intellectual maturity in the university setting? Should students not be prepared to engage in ideas which they might find a little unsettling? If, if they're not, what are we doing here? <laughs> extreme rising violence against people in minorities. That has been something that has been coming out of the woodwork for a long time and has very much made itself known. Okay, thanks. Uh, we're going to move to the next, uh, to the next question. I just have yeah. one last very quick. Yeah, sentence. Very quick. Sure. Um, if you want to look at history and look at how all those organizations that actually caused violence and death were formed, this is what it looked like. Yeah. They put up posters, they made clubs, yeah. they got followers. Yeah, we allowed them to create propaganda that led to the harm and death of many minorities. Okay. And we're just saying, okay, let's cool, like let's do that again. Your your but, points made. Yeah. Next next questioner. Next next questioner, please. <laughs> I wanted to say that, um, is that uh, yeah, it's a bit better. Uh, I wanted to say that uh, in, in listening and, and uh, thinking in terms of a broader discussion, uh, philosophy is not a science. Mm -hmm. I think it's a framework of ideas and, and that it can be very strong. And what about logic? I don't even think science is a well, science. For, <laughs> I don't even think science is a science. But that's oh, just me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so, but going further than that, I think what's happening is that uh, in part of the discussion of freedom of speech, we are opening things up in ways that are unwholesome in terms of we allow bigotry to creep in as um, a notion of free speech, and, and this is dangerous. And what I want to know is... From each of you, I would be very curious to know where do you think there is the line between bigotry and selling us some kind of a strange notion of free speech that allows that kind of discussion to happen. I'm totally comfortable with opening ideas and having discussions that are uncomfortable or that push the envelope, okay. But bigotry has no place bigotry as a notion. Okay. Yeah, what thank, do you think it's thank you for the question. Uh, uh, who who wishes to respond? Because Osama, do you have a you, uh, yeah? I'll, I'll, oh no, uh, no, one second. Let us no, in, in, in my opinion, I would say the line of the difference is between the freedom of speech goes away when it becomes hate speech. That's where. Well, that's where the freedom of speech is not the right freedom of speech. When it becomes, so when when it becomes, when it becomes a hate speech, when it becomes a hate speech. Uh, that you are uh, targeting a group or targeting audience or targeting students, that's where it's not the right freedom of speech. So that's that is the intersect of free speech that needs to be talked about and evolved and, and focused on because allowing uh, people to disguise or use a, a bigotry as a way of uh, shaping free speech is not acceptable. So where is that line? Mark, did you want to uh, address this point? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I got But Russell, Russell then. Russell's got something. So, I mean, I, I think a question we all need to ask ourselves is, without a free academy where ideas can be challenged and created and destroyed through, you know, the processes of academic freedom being exerted, how are we ever going to be able to devise reasonable criteria for what constitutes bigotry Woo! to begin with? <laughs> Lindsay, did you want to uh, say anything to this point? Yeah, what is your definition of bigotry? What is well, okay, no. let's, have, let's go on. Yes, uh, Lindsay, did you want to respond to this question? Well, just exactly what's going on here right now is another example of linguistic imperialism, right? I could add that to the list, bigotry. It's subjective. Yeah. So okay. that's what's kind of like the tension here. But is it, Next is question, that, is that then. what's wrong about it, though? Is Next that, question. Is that like, no, no. Uh, you have to have. But, but what are the? Uh, what are the? Uh, if you want to ask a question. 
you guys have said some amazing things. I just have one question to take the conversation further. We've talked a lot about academic freedom and its benefits, but I'm wondering, in your opinion, what are some of the consequences that a lack of academic freedom may have on the individual intellectual in the university space? Yeah, Mark, you yeah. want to go first? Yeah, I'd say... I can't remember who said it, but it's something about education, university education, <laughs> attending to the individual as a whole. The idea being that it would be hard to call somebody educated if by the end of their education, we wouldn't say, it, we couldn't say that they were somehow better off than they were before that. So what I worry about for constraints going too far is getting to a point where you aren't better off than you were before, that you haven't grown in some sense through these, these four years or however long it may be. So there's, there's that and I, I think, it, so yeah, I guess I, I, I talked a little bit about like constraint, constraining an individual, like it, or sorry, constraining an individual's mind versus trying to expand it. So that's what I worry about. If we say there are certain no-go areas, and, and maybe there are, and so like in response to that question there, where do you draw the line? I don't know where to draw the line. I know that I hold certain principles about what a university is and should be, but I'm not sure beyond an individual basis where that line is to be drawn. But what I do want to make sure is that by the end of this, everybody who's taken part of it has an opportunity to say that they've grown as an individual as opposed to further entrenching themselves into their already held beliefs. Lindsay, I thought you wanted to respond. No. Osama. Uh, I think the, the, the lack when it comes to uh, academic freedom uh, falls under different, different aspects. Uh, as uh, as uh, Mark mentioned, you know, we are, we are in an open education university where uh, we need to have discussions. We we should have discussions because it's not it's not always what's inside the book that's right. You know, we we always and and that's that's part of your university experience when it comes to having discussion, which was <coughs> a group discussion or or, or a class dis discussion. And uh, the lack of of academic freedom will, will just take all this experience from 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 what it means to be educated or for what it means to have a bachelor in the university, whatever uh, degree uh, you have. So that's what I believe. I've, I've written on this topic, so I'll say something if you don't mind. Uh, I'm not a panelist, but um, if, if um, the, the point of the uh, university is to help people um, express moral and intellectual autonomy and to develop so that they have moral intellectual autonomy, um, then that, that means that they're uh, uh, believing and valuing for their own good reasons. Uh, if they're constrained, if they're not able to, uh, to exercise academic freedom, freedom of discussion, freedom of expression, freedom of uh, determination, uh, then they lose that. So even if they value correctly and even if they believe truly, they're not valuing correctly or believing truly for the right reasons. They're believing truly because of the constraints that force them to, and they're valuing correctly because of the constraints. Um, to be educated is to uh, believe and value for your own good reasons, and part of that is, uh, uh, what's required for that is a, uh, an atmosphere of freedom. And without that atmosphere, your beliefs and values aren't truly your own. But isn't education part of addressing some boundaries or some limits of... of That's indoctrination or training, I would think. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, I'm not on the panel. Forgive Russell me. Wanted uh, uh, Russell wanted to yeah, finish. Yeah, yeah your, your question was it, it, it was regarding what, what are some effects we might observe when academic freedom is, is being limited. Am I am I getting that right? Well, well, one one effect which I have observed is that you know students, particularly in the arts, like the humanities and the social science courses, are, are being required to study substandard works that have made it onto the syllabus only because of their status as a classic or for some other cause apart from academic merit because I think you know academic freedom is importantly related to the to the concept of, of the principle of academic merit right and uh, you know the idea that uh, academic merit has to do with the, the solution to some sort of intellectual problem you know and we're, we're promoting a lot of a, a lot of texts that really just create a, a shroud of, of, uh, of confusion rather than uh, you know shedding shedding light on the, the kinds of problems which we're concerned with 
you know, we're, we're reading stuff that, that's out of date. We're, we're still spending a lot of time on, on thinkers that existed, like, you know, before most recorded history existed, you know, and, and it's, it's like, you know, these, these people were, were, were thinking or, or trying to think about stuff before logic was, was even really invented as a discipline. Why are we spending so much time on, on this, these kinds of, of thought? You know, it, it just, uh, you know, the control of the academy to a large extent is in the hands of ideologues who organize things to promote their ends of, you know, Not making like heaven on earth or <laughs> instilling, by instilling the correct attitudes in students. And, you know, these are the people that also organize the classroom and the academic events as well as the programs of study. Next question, please. Thank you. How is that not a conspiracy theory? <laughs> um, I'd first of all say that it is a, it's not a conspiracy theory because it happens to everyone, and Lindsay Shepard is actually a staple of that. It's the fact that academia Take is corrupted. Stand, Lindsay, right here. I mean, I'd be, I think I'd be kind of scared if my university tried to censor me for showing a TBO clip in class. I'm sorry, but that seems wrong. And the fact that all of this seems to be a conflation between freedom of speech and Nazism yeah. is absolutely ridiculous. Yeah! Love it! actually for liberal ideals would be ashamed of you entirely. And... I guess I actually just wanted to address uh, Asama's uh, point because you guys had sort of a little debate about uh, where you should draw the line when it comes to a poster. Um, so could I get you to reiterate where you think the, the line is? Yeah, when, when it dares to be a hate speech, when it dares okay. to be, when it dares to be, there's no discussion. That, that, so you just wanna, you just wanna. Uh, target a group without telling them let's sit on the table and have a discussion because part of the academic freedom is having a free discussion and that's what I'm the line for me. The problem with that logic is that how do you define targeting? How do you define targeting? So you told me you're a First Nation, right? I am partially First Nation. Yeah, you're a First Nation. Uh, would you like someone uh, to come and have a poster uh, that disrespect First Nation in many ways, and they want to put the poster up, but they don't want to sit with you and discuss it. They don't want to face you and sit in front of you and tell you this is what we believe. Would you, as a student, if you are a student here at St. Mary's, would you like to would you like to be walking to your class and see that poster right next to your class that disrespect you, disrespect your family, and disrespect your nation? Well, I think first of all we need to make. Uh, Mike Peterson actually pointed I'm just out asking. I'm no, just, no, no, no. You want to answer my yeah, question? There's, there's, there's many answer. conflations within what you're saying, right? So what we need to understand is that, and as uh, philosophy majors would understand, there are qualitative distinctions between ideologies, right? So you said that you shouldn't be able to write down that Islam isn't the right religion or Christianity isn't the right religion, but you say that they should be allowed to discuss it. Um, to debate. Okay, well, just make your point quickly, because we want to get to the line. Exactly. Yeah, thanks. Sir. To, to have a debate about it, yeah, for sure. That will, that will be. But, and but that's if, part of the experience, you if, know, to sit If that have, debate is subsequently on the same thing that the poster has, then what's the difference? If, if, if you don't, if you, if you feel like you, you are getting attacked or offended by that poster, you will go and show your perspective. Is it unique no, no, next, uh, you're next question, attacked, please. Yeah. You're not being attacked. Yeah. yeah. The, the next, question. next question, please. <laughs> So I just have a few questions for the panelists. Um, yes or no questions. Do you agree the freedom of speech, the definition of which is freedom to express yourself without restriction? Yes or no? Yes. You said freedom of speech, correct? Freedom of speech. Yeah, so freedom of speech is the freedom to unrestrictedly speak. Yes, that's what it means. Okay, so I could express my views tonight on black culture or uh, abortion from a pro-life stance, not well. That's not here, our topic. I speak that anywhere. <laughs> that's anywhere. not our topic. No, no, no. But I mean, the, I, I would be able to do that though without censorship. In a free speech zone, yes, you would. Free speech zone. Free speech zone. Free speech zone. I'm sorry. Do, do you have, do you have a, a question that okay, we can get our? Okay, sorry. These are yes or no questions. Um, yeah. Do you have any friends or acquaintances who are Nazis? <laughs> Well, can we, can, we, can we move to the next question, please? We know the answer. We don't know the answer. 
Politic is freedom of, of expression yeah. in academia, right? Yeah. No, well, it's fr academic freedom, yes. Academic freedom. So yes. Defined by the freedom of speech principle. You know that the well, Nazis weren't in favor of academic freedom, right? <laughs> but <laughs> but yeah, there's all that sarcasm. <laughs> I just have a quick comment and a question for our student body president. I don't really want to hear from the rest of the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Lindsay, last month you tweeted, many people seem to think that just because I question or criticize someone's words, it automatically means I want them silenced. Couldn't it be further from the truth? I believe people should say what they please, no matter how disrespectful. To me, that constitutes advocating for hate speech. Now, my question to the SUNY body president. If, say, it wasn't Lindsay who came to the freedom of speech, but maybe Richard Spencer, would you be sitting there having a debate with Richard Spencer, allowing him on campus, having a panel and everything? Would you, you mind if asking that? Who was, uh, Richard Spencer? He's a white supremacist. No, I wouldn't. Lindsay, did you. you want to respond? Yeah, well, I think it's interesting because this person had their face covered, so it's almost like I could argue this is like an unsafe. I walked away and he's walking away. There was a lot of Nazis here today, so. Yeah, but that's what they say. 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 Yeah, but that's what they they're damaging the mission of, of what they're trying to accomplish. Because I also, I believe in the non-ideologically infiltrated version of social justice. And it's, it's sad to me that these people damage what it's about. It's really sad to me. Question, please. I have a question. It is rhetorical and it is heavier than an issue of speech. If I were to become pregnant and were legally forced to give birth, am I free? Do, uh, do any of the panelists want to respond? It's apparently, it's clear of no. I, I, don't I mean, it's, it's off topic, but my personal answer would probably be no. But You're not free. I still think a rational discussion can be had about, you know, the, the, the pro-life argument as well as the pro-choice argument. I myself am pro-choice. I, I do have, like, you know, sympathetic feelings towards some certain views on the pro-life side because, you know, I do think at a certain point the fetus, you know, should, should probably be considered more human than, you know, just a bunch of cells. It, it, it depends, you know, how late it is in the pregnancy. For example, it's a protest. It wasn't an academic discussion. Mm -hmm. People affected by the discussion weren't given the choice to engage in it. They were forced to. Well, I was just trying to bring it back to the topic of... Yeah. Bring, bring it back to the topic and actually bringing it back to this issue that was raised multiple times of political actors within the university, I think it's important to confront that and name that directly um, and name the presence of right-wing reactionary political actors within the university. I think uh, exemplary of this, I want to raise the question of why, for example, did the president of the, uh, the hosts of tonight's event find it necessary to speak out defending the right of Dell Dentistry students to uh, make threatening comments about raping their females? fellow students, whereas failed miserably to come to the defense of, say, Mr. McCann. I did. We see again and again this pattern. Uh, Lindsay, in particular, you were quite explicit about uh, not defending the students. Just what? Freedom of speech on Twitter. Uh, no, the that's, tweets that's there, anyone can read it and decide for themselves. I'm still asking a question, please. Um, so I'd like you to speak to the issue. Um, you've talked about political actors, political actors, political actors, and talked about this need to engage directly. Um, do you mean a particular type of political actor? Is this an, a particular ideological persuasion you're concerned with? Is there this coded, we're concerned about left academics that has run through this? Um, and are you yourselves on the political right? I, I would argue that playing ball with Faith Goldie, a noted white supremacist, probably puts you on the right, even when you're calling yourself a into social justice. Okay, okay. That's called bullshit, bullshit. Uh, so can I can I say uh, just just for the record, um, I published an article in defense of Masuma Khan. Uh, I, go ahead. Yes, and and I also I also. I I complete. 
Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we can if you want, Lizzie. No, I mean, I, I do want to say for the record that, that I completely defend what Musuma Khan says. Of course. She has the right to express whatever she wants on social media. I was also, the administration also came after me for what I posted on social media. But you're conflating what I said. So the, the reason is I was compared to Musuma Khan on many occasions in, in many editorials. And, uh, you know, one of the questions was, you know, why, why, does, why do I have such a larger following than she does? And you know, uh, something that was brought up was her race and religion, and that's a valid point, completely valid. But you know, <coughs> um, anyway, yeah. yeah. What, what, what uh, point next question, please. Lab academic? Is this actually what you're talking about? And no, uh, we, we, have, we have we have some at the about, uh, political, political actors. I think that was directed towards me. Uh, I just don't. I want to say I don't think it is about left or right. I think it's just about lining people up behind politicians. So that who, who are serving as the agents of the finance capitalists that are running things. Oh. I honestly think that it's just you know about maintaining the control, and that's why these political operatives are being instituted into institutions of education to, to, to put an academic veneer over the propaganda. It, it's just to serve as a means to just keep the, the march of tyranny rolling. So well, I don't think it is about left or right. Next question, please. Okay. Yeah, the microphone's gone <laughs> down. <laughs> So I'd like to like don't throw it though. I'm, no, um, I'd like to press you a bit more on the idea of ideologues. What you've categorized as, I think, ideologues. Well, uh, this will be the last question, by the way, but because we're out of time, we go upstairs and talk. Right. We have the room rented for a certain time. Mm -hmm. um, the idea, of act, like ideologues versus academic freedom, right? Or, or people who advocate for academic freedom. I want to know what. Without sort of the politics, which are subjective and wrong or whatever, what does an academic course look like? What does it look like? Well, okay, Russell. Very, very quickly, the rigorous pursuit of knowledge through application of empirical research, well-founded reasoning, and, you know, Articulate methodology. Yeah, but it's when the questions become more abstract than orange, and orange is orange. That kind of empirical data doesn't mean as much without interpretation. Then we refer to the, the, the well-founded reasoning and conceptual analysis mm -hmm. through Who's logical well application. Who's well-founded my, my, my question Mark? is, is like, what is what, is, what do these debates look like when they're not political, I guess? Mark, did you want to answer? No, I just want Exactly. What do academic <laughs> debates look like if they're not political? Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't really know how to answer that except to say, like coming from, a, from philosophy, um, you know, so long as the course in question isn't with the philosophy of politics, because <laughs> then it probably will involve some political talk, but what I mean is trying to present a view. So let's just, just take this as an example. Let's say I'm, I'm a, like, okay, a member example, of the... Um, just, to, just to make it like, more clear. Um, what, how do you empirically define what is or is not bigotry? Okay, that like, one because is, the word means something, and we all know that it means something. Yeah. But how do you go out and collect data, and then what well-reasoned criteria are you using to define, to, to define which like evidence or um, arguments matter and which ones don't, if it's not in some way a political, or at least a value-based understanding of that concept. Okay, right? but, but when you say subjective, do you mean something about which very quickly, Mark, we gotta okay. go. <laughs> Do you think that just because something is subjective that, that it's based on emotions or just some conjecture? Or, or when you say subjective, do you mean something about which we just don't have an objective answer for? Something that can't be proven? That's what I... Yeah, does that fall off the syllabus? Because it can't be objectively answered? No, no, absolutely not. Okay. It, it, and, and then what happens? You know, so I mean, this is, it's, it's a matter of epistemology, what we, whether or not there is such a thing as objective knowledge at all, whether all knowledge is subjective. Yeah. 
So we go down the rabbit hole. Exactly. <laughs> And it's a and it deep, and it's a dark rabbit hole. And yeah, you could argue it doesn't go anywhere. I'd say it does go somewhere, but it, after 2,000 years, probably haven't come up with any certain answers yet. You'll get baby rabbits. Anyone else uh, <laughs> want to? Okay. Oh, very quickly, very quickly, yeah. Thanks. Quick question. Couple minutes later. Uh, Lindsay and the uh, laser guy. Uh, according to the arguments put forth by you and your supporters, supporting supporters such as Mike Sonovich, the organizer of the Unite the Right Neo Nazi rally in Charlottesville. There's a subversive, politically motivated plot to infiltrate Western academia and other Western institutions. Uh, this delusion is known as cultural Marxism. Uh, I would like you to elaborate on this idea and what it means to you. Do you want to respond? Lindsay, I have nothing to say, but I have no idea. I really don't know what to say on that. Well, uh, the video that Lindsay uh, showed to her students was a Jordan Peterson video, and I believe he is a huge uh, proponent of cultural Marxism uh, ideology and the fact that it exists at all. No, he, that's what I'm saying, he believes in a conspiracy theory. It's a conspiracy theory. It's a conspiracy theory invented by literal Nazis. Go Google, you don't believe me? Google on your phones right now, everybody. Google cultural Marxism. <laughs> no, but I guess like I guess this was right though. Well, if we had learned anything about the Shepherd case, I think we could at least give some credence to the idea that you know there is uh, some ideologues that are operative in the institutions. After all, people were accusing Lindsay Shepherd of being some kind of agent of Peterson's because you know, of course, he's sneaky like that, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, no, but the Marxists are sneaky like that, right? <laughs> Can, well, we're out of we're out we're out of time. Mark, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, yeah, for you. attendance Nazi and scum. and we're uh, there's there's a reception on the fourth floor of the Sobe Building. Um, the the cheese and crackers are free. The wine isn't. Uh, thank you very much I for coming. Be out. Some of the curse of name we were talking about. Oh.